Good morning, our preteens. Pastor Dyson here, back with another Sunday lesson. I hope you guys had a great sleep last night, that you ate a good breakfast, and that you're ready to dig into God's Word together this morning. Links to all of our playlists are down in the description, including our clip of the week, which has been updated. So make sure you go check out some of those and our other videos when you have a chance, if you have some free time after our lesson or later on in your week. Just a reminder to stay tuned until the very end of our lesson because we always include our preteen announcements at the very end of our lesson so make sure you stick around so you don't miss any of our important information or announcements that we have for you and for your families all right today we're jumping straight into the question of the day every sunday lesson here at our preteens we have our question of the day it's the one question that we ask it's the title of the youtube video so you already know it but it's the one question that we seek to ask, and when we ask that question, then we go to our Bibles to answer that question. So our question of the day today is, is it bad to be rich? Or you could phrase it another way and say, is it a sin to be rich? Is it bad to be rich? Well, we need to define our terms first because rich can mean a lot of things. And so I have two discussion questions that I want you to start off with this morning. So every Sunday lesson here at our preteens, we disperse these discussion questions throughout our lesson. And these questions are an opportunity for you to pause the video and have a conversation with whoever you're watching this video with, whether it be your parents or your siblings or maybe a friend uh, or in whatever context you're watching this video to have a conversation. Or if, you don't, if you're not watching this video with anyone, if you have a piece of paper and a pen, you can journal your responses down. Or if you don't have either, you can just pause and think about your answers to these questions. But the first two discussion questions that I want to ask you this morning are related to what it means to be rich. So the first is what's the lowest dollar amount you'd need before you'd call yourself rich and why do you choose that amount? So what I mean by this is what is that threshold of money where you would consider yourself rich? Is it if you have $1,000, would you consider yourself rich? Is it, oh, I have $10,000, so now I'm rich. Is it 100,000? Is it a million? Is it a billion? What's that threshold where once you hit it, you would say, yeah, I'm rich. What's that lowest dollar amount that you can get it to? And then why are you picking that amount? Why that amount and not less? Why that amount or not more? And then the second question, once you've figured out what it means to be rich, what are the pros and cons of being rich? What is good about being rich? But what is bad about being rich? Think about both sides because there are bad, there are downsides. There are bad things. You might need your parents to help you. But what are the pros and cons of being rich. So what's the lowest dollar amount you would need to call yourself before you would call yourself rich? And then what are the pros and cons of being rich? So take a moment, pause the video here and consider these two questions. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone says money, I start thinking aside from the real thing, like from actual money, usually when I hear someone talking about money, my mind immediately goes to monopoly. Some have called it the great destroyer of friendships. Others have called it a game that takes too long. Others a game that is too boring. And still others a game which is too close to reality. But the goal of Monopoly is simple. You go around the board, you buy up properties. If someone lands on your property, they owe you money for staying on your property. And so the goal of Monopoly is simple. You need to start making so much money out of all your properties that you own that you start to squeeze out your uh, the other people that you're playing with. The other people start to lose money and you are making more money than they are. And you need to squeeze them out of the game. You need to bankrupt the people that you're playing with so you are in control of the money. And by the end of the game of Monopoly, one person is rich, one person has all the money, while all the rest of the other players of the game end up with nothing if you play till the very end. And if you're like me, and you absolutely hate losing at anything from a soccer game to a coin flip, then the temptation to cheat during a game of Monopoly is very, very strong. After all, when someone stops for a bathroom break and they walk away, no one will see you slip an extra $100 bill into your pile, will they? Or what could go wrong if I subtly moved a house from one of their properties onto one of my properties? And while cheating is always wrong, in a game of Monopoly, the difference that you get from cheating at the end of the day doesn't really mean anything. Yes, it's a lack of integrity. You were dishonest and those are bad things. But you're not causing real lasting harm to someone because when all is said and done, when you pack up all the pieces, you put away all the money, you fold up the board, you put it in the box and put the box back on the shelf, the game is put away and there's no lasting impacts. But when it comes to getting rich in real life, it's incredibly tempting to cut corners. It's incredibly tempting to take advantage of other people and to do whatever it takes to come out on top. Daryl Strawberry 
That's an interesting last name, Strawberry. Daryl Strawberry, he was a famous baseball player from the 80s and 90s. He played for the New York Mets, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the New York Giants, and then finally the New York Yankees. Daryl Strawberry was convicted in 1994 of tax evasion. And you're probably wondering, Pastor Dyson, why are you talking about tax evasion? That seems like something only wealthy people do. And I don't, Pastor Dyson, I'm in grade five. I don't even know what tax evasion is. Well, tax evasion is simply when you pay taxes, when you make money, you need to pay taxes. You give a portion of it to the government because, you know, the government has military that protects us from external threats. And we have all these government programs, ta taxes, the whole thing. But basically, when you earn money, a portion of that goes to the government. And tax evasion is when you evade paying your taxes, is when you don't pay the amount that you owe. And so Daryl Strawberry didn't pay the amount of or the proper amount of taxes that he owed based on how much money he was making when he was playing for the New York Mets. Daryl Strawberry cut corners in order to try and keep more of his money for himself. And that's one reason why people are suspicious of rich people. We always wonder if rich people cheated to get rich or if they didn't care about others and did whatever they could and took advantage of those who had less in order to become rich. These kinds of people that doubt rich people or have suspicions about rich people, they wonder if having money just makes you automatically evil. Like if you're a rich person, a rich person, you're automatically a supervillain from like a Marvel comic book, basically. Or some people would believe the uh, the total opposite of that. They would they would believe that if you have a lot of money, it means that God must love you so much more than other people. And both both of these things are wrong, and we'll address why they're wrong as we continue. But I want to remind you quickly of this biblical truth that we find in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. The Apostle Paul writes to us regarding salvation. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, preteens, when it comes to being saved from our sins, when it comes to the grace of God that's delivered to us through the atoning death of his son Jesus on the cross in our place, there is no distinction. Your country of origin doesn't matter. Your skin color doesn't matter. Your language doesn't matter. The amount of money you have doesn't matter. And your gender doesn't matter. You are not more worthy or more deserving of salvation because you speak more than one language. You are not more worthy or deserving of salvation because of the amount of melanin in your skin. You are not more worthy or deserving of salvation because you're from Canada, America, the Philippines, Sweden, India, Egypt, or South Korea. And you are not more worthy and deserving of salvation because of the amount of money that you have or don't have. We all are in desperate need of salvation because no one is worthy of salvation. No one deserves salvation. And that's why we describe the forgiveness that, God's, that God provides for us from our sin through Jesus as grace. Because grace is not something that you deserve or earn. You can't force God to give you grace. It's something that is freely given by God. And that grace is given to you regardless of any distinction you could possibly think of and it says right there at the end of the verse for you are all one in christ jesus we are one in christ okay so with that clarified that distinctions don't make us more worthy of salvation or of being saved or of grace or forgiveness of our sins you can't earn it you don't deserve it based on anything now that we've clarified that let's do an object lesson to put money in perspective okay so right now i want you to pause the video and I want you to type into Google random number generator. The random number generator will be at the top of the page. It'll say, it'll have like the number and then it'll say min and max, like minimum and maximum. And when it, where it says minimum, where it says min, I want you to enter the number eight. And where it says maximum, I want you to put the number 15, okay? So our, our range is eight to 15. Eight is the minimum, 15 is the maximum. All right, so pause the video here. Go to the random number generator, set the minimum to 8 and the maximum to 15. All right, so now that you've gone to the random number generator, you set the minimum, you set the maximum. Now I want you to hit generate. So go and generate yourself a random number. So I generated myself a random number on Google. I don't know if you can see it, but it's on my phone. I have generated the number 13. Hopefully the camera focuses. But my random number between 8 and 15 is 13. All right. So I'm going to assume that you have your number. If you need to pause and go do that, you can do it. But once you have your number, okay, 
let's get started. According to the United Nations, about half of the world's population lives on less than $2.50 per day. The minimum wage in BC is $15.20 this year for comparison. One billion people, or sorry, one billion children live in poverty, and UNICEF reports that 22,000 children die each day due to extreme poverty. These are tragic numbers. And 805 million people worldwide don't have enough food to eat. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to take your number, and since we can't survive without food, I want you to subtract 3 from your number. So minus 13, so 13 minus 3, so I'm at 10 now. If you're at 8, you'll be at 5, and so on and so forth. If you're at 15, you'll be at 12. So I want you to take your number and subtract 3, okay? Now, more than 750 million people lack adequate access to clean drinking water, all right? So we couldn't survive without food, but we also can't survive without water. So I want you to go ahead and subtract another 3 from your new number. So my new number, I went from 13 to 10. I'm subtracting 3 again. Now I'm at 7. So subtract 3 from your number for drinking water. Okay, a quarter of people worldwide live without electricity. Electricity is handy for lots of reasons, and in many places, and for many things, electri electricity is necessary for our appliances and for a multitude of things. All right, now subtract one. Subtract one from your new number. And now medical care is a big deal. About half of the world lacks at least some form of essential health care. So subtract two from your number now. Some of you have just hit zero now, and some of you have actually gone into the negative from your numbers because we minus three, we minus another three, then we minus one, and now we're minusing two. So some of you are at zero now, some of you are hitting the negatives, and some of you are getting close to zero, but we're not finished. About 22% of people worldwide lack proper shelter. Subtract another two of what you have left since people need shelter. All right, what's your final number at now? My, I'm at 2 because I started at 13 and all of those things that we listed add up to 11 in total. So I'm at 2. For the people that started at 15, you guys are at 4. For the people who started at 8, you guys are at negative 3. And for those who started at 11, you're now at 0. And so if your number is anywhere above 0 in this exercise, you would be considered rich in our scenario. Because many people in the world find themselves without food, clean water, electricity, medical care, and shelter. They actually run out of money before they run out of needs. They hit zero before all their needs have been accounted for. And so based on this exercise, maybe you found out by comparison with the rest of the world that you actually are relatively rich. Or maybe you, find, maybe you found out that you're not, but you would like to be. And so let's see if being rich truly is a problem. Now that we've properly framed uh, money in our context in North America, let's examine our Bibles and let's see what God has to say about money. The Bible has a lot of warnings about money as a trap. Let's read some of those passages and see if we can get a better idea of what the trap is and how it works. Mark chapter 8 verse 36, Jesus says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Proverbs eleven twenty eight, Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Jesus says again, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. And finally, 1 Timothy 6, 10, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, craving money, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So based on those five verses, what is the trap related to money and why does the trap work? So take a moment, pause here, and based on those five verses, if you need to rewind and read them again, if you want to go get your own physical Bible and read them in your own Bible, by all means, do that. It's the beauty of YouTube. You can pause and resume as you want and rewind as you would like. So what is the trap based on those five verses that we just read from Mark, Matthew, Proverbs, and 1 Timothy? And why does the trap 
work. So take a moment, pause here, and consider this. Now that last passage we read, 1 Timothy 6.10, is often actually misquoted. People often say mistakenly, money is the root of all evil. But 1 Timothy 6.10 explicitly says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, not money itself. And so my next question is, why would the love of money be the root of evil, not money itself? What is, what is the difference between the desire for money and the actual physical, literal tool, instrument of money itself. Take a moment, pause here, and consider the difference between the desire and, the, and money itself. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12, we're also working through Philippians in our Discord Devo, so we'll eventually get to this passage that we're going to read. But the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians, and he says, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And then in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, we read, we read, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Based on these two verses, how would it look if your attitudes about money reflected the principles that are in these passages in Philippians 4, 11 to 12, and in Proverbs 3, 9. Again, if you need to rewind, you can if you want to read them again. But what would it look like if your attitudes about money reflected the principles of these passages? Take a moment, pause here, and consider this. Let's see what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 23 to 26, we read, Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. So avoiding the traps that we can fall into regarding money, avoiding those traps is hard. And those traps catch way too many people today. And we are not immune from being caught in those traps. And based just on our readings of the verses that we've gone through this morning, we've covered six passages of warning versus the two passages of what it means to be truly rich. It seems like the Bible talks a lot more about the traps and the dangers and the cautions of the treasures of money than of the money or treasures themselves. And so my next three questions for you, discussion questions. Does having more money make it easier or more difficult to avoid the traps? Second, what should our attitude toward wealth be? And third, how would you answer today's question of the day? Is it bad to be rich based on everything that we've read so far? So take a moment, pause here and consider these three questions. As I said right off the top, whether you have lots of money or barely any, Jesus loves you the same way. And whether you have lots of money or none, Jesus wants to be first in your life. As a Christian, the throne of our heart can only belong to Jesus. Anything else that we would set up to serve instead of Jesus would be a cruel master to serve and an utter failure to deliver us or bring us joy and peace and all the things that Christ brings. That's what the rich young ruler discovered when he asked Jesus what he would have to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus told him to obey the commandments of loving God fully and loving others fully. And the rich young ruler, after hearing this, said this, Matthew 19, verse 20 to 22. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? So right there, the rich young ruler doesn't understand because nobody has loved God perfectly and nobody has loved their neighbor perfectly. But this young, rich young ruler thinks he has. And so he says, what else must I do? And we pick it up at verse 21. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. My next discussion question, what do you think the rich young ruler was thinking as he walked away from Jesus? He comes to Jesus, he asks, asks Jesus, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, keep the commandments to love God perfectly and to love your neighbor perfectly. And the rich young ruler foolishly says, I have loved God perfectly and I've loved my neighbor perfectly. What else must I do? And Jesus has told him, 
go sell everything you have and give give the money away to the poor. And the rich young ruler walks away sad. What was he thinking when he was walking away from Jesus? Take a moment, pause here, and put yourself in the shoes of the rich young ruler. Now, the Bible doesn't record Jesus ever telling someone else to sell all their stuff and to stop being rich. That was just for this rich young ruler who had let his wealth get in the way, blinding him with pride so he couldn't follow Jesus. Other people in the Bible, like Abraham, King David, and King Solomon, they had tons of wealth, and they weren't asked by God to forfeit their riches. Jesus asked the rich young ruler to give up stuff, to give up stuff that rusts, that was rusting, because, you know, treasures on earth that we read rusts, and the moth eats it, and the thief steals it. Jesus was asking the rich young ruler to give up the stuff that rusts for what's new and fresh and never rusts forever, which is eternal life with God. And the man wasn't ready or able to do that because his heart had been gripped by the riches and cares of this world rather than by the treasures of eternity. It seems that being rich isn't necessarily bad, but it can be a distraction and it can lead to sin if not carefully understood. We can focus more on money than on Jesus. It's so easy for us to do that. We can become selfish so easily. We begin trusting our riches more than we trust God. And when a love of money gets in the way of a love of God, then it's a sin. Because Jesus is not just our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our King. He is our Master. As we've been looking at our study in Philippians, Paul uses the word doulos in Greek, which literally translates to slave. We are slaves of Christ Jesus. Jesus is our master. And so we cannot serve two masters. Jesus will occupy the primary and highest place in our hearts. And to put anything else in that place that is rightfully his, that he has earned because he has bought us with the price of his own life, to put anything else in that place is to raise up an idol, a false god, a false master, it's to raise up that idol to try and compete with Christ's rule in our lives. And as we read in Matthew, we cannot serve two masters because we will end up hating one and loving the other. And as often as it is with the love of money, we will end up loving money and hating Christ. That's the, that's the temptation. The 19th century Baptist preacher Charles, Charles Spurgeon had this to say about money. It is very difficult for a man to have much money running through his hands without some of it sticking. It is very sticky stuff. And when it once sticks to the hands, they are not clean in the sight of the Lord. Unless a man is able to use money without abusing it, accepting it as a talent lent to him and not as a treasure given to him, it will very soon happen that the more money he has, the more troubles he will have. And that leads me to my big idea this morning, summing up, Everything that we've talked about this morning, every Sunday lesson here at Arc Preteens, we have our big idea. It's basically our answer to the question of the day. It's our one point, one sentence summary of all the scriptures that we've looked at. It even kind of builds off this quote of Spurgeon's. And our big idea for today is it's not bad to be rich, but it is dangerous. As we've seen in the passages of scripture and as we just looked at in Spurgeon's quote when he was preaching, money in and of itself, the money itself is not a sin. It is not a sin to have money, but it is a sin when the love of said money begins to dominate our hearts instead of Christ. When we serve money instead of serving the Lord, we have misaligned our priorities and we've propped up an idol, a fake, cruel, and fickle master ahead of our good shepherd. Being rich isn't bad, but it is dangerous if we don't exercise appropriate caution. Everyone experiences different temptations, and being rich brings its own unique temptations. Being poor has its own unique temptations. But in everything, whether rich or poor, we must continually guard our hearts and our minds against the evils of our world, against the temptations of the enemy, and we must continually ask the Holy Spirit to fortify our hearts and minds that we would resist temptation, that we would hate sin, and exercise self-control because we can't do this of our own volition. We need the Holy Spirit's divine assistance to help us do these things because when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we repent and confess our sins and believe upon Jesus, 
His Holy Spirit comes to live within us to help us live the Christian life. And so we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to resist the temptations of the world, to hate sin, and to exercise self-control because self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And so let's now turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to strengthen our hearts that we may not be given over to the love of money or to any other wicked temptation in this world so that we would continue on the path of righteousness that he has marked out before us. Preteens, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another Sunday lesson that we could come together and honor you, Lord, and honor you in the study of your word as we've surveyed both Old and New Testament alike. We've looked at some examples. We've heard quotes from other godly men and preachers who have have echoed what your word has said. And Lord, it is clear to us that being rich is not a sin in and of itself, but it is a danger and it is a, a, a great temptation to sin, Lord. Because the love of money is so corrupting, it's so easy to fall into the trap of loving money over loving our Savior. And Lord, it is our daily lament and regret that we don't that we don't love you perfectly because we still sin in our fleshly bodies, Lord, that the flesh still lingers. And while your Holy Spirit dwells within us, sanctifying us to help us walk in holiness and righteousness, to help us do what is right, to resist temptation, to hate sin, and to exercise self-control, Lord, daily we still fail. We are still in need of your grace. And I thank you that the multitude of our sins is covered in the blood of Christ Jesus once and for all, that we don't have to offer any more sacrifices, that Jesus doesn't have to die again for us, Lord, but that his death was final and his resurrection was the triumph, was the victory. And so that we are no longer ruled by sin. We are no longer subject to the flesh, but we are subject to our good shepherd. We are slaves Lord, of you, and you are a good master. You're not cruel. You're not fickle. You don't change your mind. You don't exercise double standards. You don't show favoritism. But Lord, you are fair, you are just, and you are righteous. And so Lord, lead us in that righteousness and in the just way. Help us to walk upright. Don't allow us to be dragged down by this world and its wickedness and its temptations, Lord, but help us to remain focused on you, that we may live for you and glorify you in our lives and seek to do your will and see your will accomplished in everything that we do think and say. For Lord, we live in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, but you will help us to shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, to the gospel that you have given us. So Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to spread this gospel to spread it far and wide to the rich, to the poor, to men, to women, to people in other countries, to the people who speak different languages, to people who look different from us, Lord, and to any and everyone that we come in contact with, would we tell them the good news of forgiveness and grace from sins that there is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, Lord, would you rule and reign in our hearts? Lord, take up your rightful place over our lives. Have dominion. Lord, may we serve you in all that we think, say, and do. And, Lord, I pray and ask, that you would bless our Sunday lunches, bless the hands that are preparing our food, may the food nourish our bodies, may you bless the conversations that we have while we eat, whether it be whether they be with friends, family, or strangers. And Lord, in all things, would we glorify you, would we honor you, and would we trust you. We thank you, Lord, we love you, and we pray and ask all these things in your holy and precious name, and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our other Sunday lessons or any of the other videos that we make. Reminder, links to all of our playlists are down in the description. So make sure you go check out the clip of the week that has been updated for you and any of our other videos when you get the chance. Well, preteens, I don't know what to tell you. We're still not meeting in person on Fridays. I Broadway has not given us the go ahead to resume. So we're just kind of waiting. I'm waiting. As soon as Broadway gives me the go ahead and the approval, we'll, we'll be there. Again, I have the sermons prepared. We're ready to go continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. But until then, we're going to keep doing our online Bible studies. And when the time comes to meet in person again, you'll know. Follow us on social media. Our social media links are down in the description. So go follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date and get your parents to follow us on Instagram and Facebook if you don't have social media so they can stay up to date on everything that's going on here at Arc Preteens. And as I briefly alluded to on Fridays, we're continuing our Discord Devos. Fridays at 7 p.m. in our Arc Preteens Discord server, we're undertaking a brief study of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. This past Friday, we covered just verse 7. We spent our time in one verse, verse 7, talking about the defense and confirmation of the gospel and what it means to be a church to support each other what it means to be the body of believers. 
And so every Friday we get together and we study the epistle to the Philippians. We're studying Paul's letter to the Philippian church together every Friday, 7 p.m. in our Discord server. All you have to do on Friday is join our Discord Devo voice channel on our Arc Preteens Discord server. We'll walk through a couple verses of Philippians and we'll talk about it. We have some questions. Uh, and if you have questions, you can ask me questions and it's very loose, very casual, but we're just studying Philippians together. We're trying to see what does God say in his word. We want to get into the details. We want to explore the Greek, the original language that it was written in, because sometimes words in Greek mean a lot more than they do in English and they convey a lot more things than they do in English. And so we're in Philippians having a good time. We're going to be in verse eight this Friday. And again, just one verse. We're going to verse eight, talking about affection, Paul's love for the Philippian church and what that means for us today as we're the church. And so if you'd like to join our Arc Preteens Discord server, send me an email. My email is down in the description and I will send you an invite to our server so you, we can get you joined up and connected for that. Season three of Minecraft Mondays will return come the summertime. So stay tuned for that when it returns because you guys are in school, so you guys can't play on Mondays right now. Season three is returning in the summer. We're gonna be playing Minecraft every Monday starting at 1 p.m. I'll live stream it to our YouTube channel right here to Arc Preteens if you guys can't play so you can watch. We play on the Java edition of Minecraft, not the console edition, not Bedrock edition, not Windows 10 edition. We play on the Java edition of Minecraft. So make sure you get the Java edition if you would like to play with us. Send me your Minecraft Java username to my email. I will get you added to our Arc Preteens realm, which is only for Arc Preteens students. So you guys can check that out. And that's all the announcements that I have for you today, preteens. I hope you guys have a great week this week as you're in school, as you're with your families and whatever else you choose to do this week. I pray that in everything you would seek the will of God. And as we talked about today, remember to have Christ at the throne on the throne of your heart, because there's so many things in life that want to take the that want to take the place of Jesus that clamor uh, for your attention and your devotion, uh, money, uh, popularity. We could slip into to anger, to pride, to arrogance, to self-righteousness. We can even slip into laziness. But preteens, fight off these temptations by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit and endeavor to have Christ on the throne of your heart every single day. Jesus said that if we were to come to him and follow him, we need to die to ourselves and take up our cross. We need to deny ourselves so that we can fully serve him because he is our good shepherd. He is the good master that we serve and follow. And so preteens, I pray that you would follow him this week, that he would bless and prosper your activities as you follow him in humility and obedience. And that in whatever you face, whether you face blessings or trials this week, know that they both come from God and he will work out all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. As we read in Romans 8, 28, God is faithful to his word. He never lies or breaks a promise. And so he said it, so he will do it. So preteens, I'm praying for you this week. Have a great week, and until next time, God bless you guys.